This week on The Communicators, a discussion on how the commercial satellite industry is affected by federal regulation. Our guest is Jennifer Manor with Mobile Satellite Ventures. Joining us this week on The Communicators is Jennifer Manor. She is the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Mobile Satellite Ventures, also serves on the Satellite Industry Association. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, a little bit as far as context, so our folks know where you're coming from. What is Mobile Satellite Ventures? We are a North American operator of a satellite system. We provide mobile satellite service throughout North America for uses like emergency response, um, things like uh, tracking of, of vehicles, um, rural communications. But where we're, most of our focus is these days is we are building a next generation mobile satellite system with a terrestrial component. And what that really means is an integrated satellite terrestrial service. So you'll have one phone and it will be able to talk to both the satellite and to um, the cellular network at the same time. So that's your current project right now as your company is concerned. That's correct. On the flip side of that, you're with the Satellite Industry Association. Mm -hmm. What's that? Um, I actually serve as chair of the board. And the Satellite Industry Association is a dynamic group of satellite operators, satellite manufacturers, launch vehicle providers, the folks who actually launch the satellites into space, um, resellers, and other critical members of the satellite industry and it's an advocacy group in Washington. As far as Washington is concerned, what levels of um, regulatory, uh, where do you fall under, regula under the regulatory system? Who, who directly manages satellite systems? That's a very good question. Um, day to day in terms of licensing, receiving authority to operate a satellite system, that falls to the Federal Communications Commission. But we actually have um, a lot of uh, contact with other agencies, um, most notably the Department of Commerce's National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, they handle, they actually manage the government spectrum, but they also are the executive branch um, policy making body on telecommunications. The Department of State has a group, the Communications and Information Policy Group. They handle um, treaty negotiations, because we operate in the spectrum, it's a very scarce resource, and that's managed both domestically and internationally. So state really takes a role, a leading role in that internationally. And Congress gets involved, of course, as well with legislation. And we also have contact with bodies like the United States Trade Representative, the Office of Science and Technology of the President, the Federal Aviation Administration, NASA, pretty much the whole alphabet. So as far as your job is concerned, do you have to chart your company's contact with all those, all those agencies? That's correct, and I also cover the international arena as well. So when you're facing these various bodies, if you could break it down for the folks at home, what are the major issues that you come up as far as when you present your issues before any of these bodies? What generally are you talking to them about? What are the major topics, so to speak? Sure, let me break it into um, a, a couple of areas that maybe are the most focused right now. Um, first is um, new technologies. One of the things that happens in any communications industry and is certainly um, happening more and more in the satellite industry is ensuring that we have flexibility to deploy new technologies, much like the system I told you about that Mobile Satellite Ventures is deploying with the integrated satellite terrestrial component. So you want to make sure that the regulations enable these new technologies to come about. So that's one important area. A second important area that goes across all the different operators is spectrum. Um, satellites operate in the spectrum resource and we need to make sure that we have it available and that it's free from interference from other services. Um, the third area where satellites in particular are important, uh, well actually two areas, one is emergency response. Um, satellites, because of the nature of the system, our system for example is a geostationary orbit system which means we're at 23,000 miles above the earth are immune from a lot of the things that happen on the ground. We don't get knocked over like a cell tower gets knocked over. So we make a lot of sense for emergency responders. Um, we're also ubiquitous. We cover large land masses. So we spend a lot of time on emergency response type issues. And the fourth issue that's been really um, more and more focused for the satellite industry is broadband. Um, as the newer systems come on board, um, folks like Wild Blue are out there today. Um, that provide broadband service. We'll be providing broadband with our next generation services. And that's very important, especially in rural areas where the terrestrial infrastructure doesn't reach quite as easily. So 
to hit a couple of those points that you made and maybe expand on them a little bit, a lot of our discussions on this program deal with spectrum, and especially especially spectrum auctions come up. When a spectrum auction comes up in, in your company's case, do you grab as much as you can? Are you eligible for every spectrum auction that comes up? And as far as how they are, are done by the FCC, does that benefit you, or are there hurdles for satellite companies, especially when it comes to that? Well, this is where we're a little bit different. Um, international satellites are not a spectrum is not subject to auction so we actually go through a different process in terms of obtaining our access to our spectrum and I'll go back the DBS direct broadcast satellites mm -hmm. and domestic satellites are subject to auction so we'll put those aside I'm not as familiar with that area uh -huh. but on the international side there's actually legislation out there that prohibits the auction of spectrum internationally and it makes sense because we operate over such wide geographic areas we'd have to go to every country and bid for spectrum so we we operate under a first come first serve pro approach mm -hmm. where the first company to apply for a license gets the spectrum Got it. Um, we do have certain bond requirements and we do have to show that we're using the spectrum we have certain milestones so for instance we have to demonstrate we're constructing a satellite and we have to launch a satellite and satellites take a very long time to construct. They're very much an art form. Or, and so it you know, could take three to five years to build a satellite. So you don't, it's not like terrestrial or land-based companies that auction. You, you apply for it, you can get it or not. That's correct. Are there different hurdles or requirements from satellite companies rather than, um, than land companies, say, at the FCC, when they're making these considerations on whether to award you Spectrum or not? Well, the spectrum is actually allocated to either satellite or terrestrial use. So it's very clear what spectrum we can apply for, and it, it's very clear whether where you can fit in or not. Mm -hmm. So there are certain requirements. The, the big difference, I think, is the fact that um, the auctions were done for a number of reasons. One was to award it in the most efficient manner. Two was to make sure the spectrum was being used in the most efficient manner. Um, the, the way that satellite licenses are awarded on this first-come, first-come basis with a bond requirement that you would lose a substantial amount of money in the millions of dollars if you don't build out mm -hmm. um, combined with the milestone requirements that you have to keep meeting every year to ensure that the, that you're moving forward with your satellite really gives the same sort of um, I'm not going to say credibility but the same level of confidence that a system is to be deployed just like a terrestrial system and that's the and so that's part of the plan you have to present in front of these various bodies. That's correct. When you present, what kind of questions do you get from the commissioners on this, or do you really relate with them at all directly? No, not on licensing issues. Since they formed, um, there was a big reformulation of the licensing process for satellites. Um, it used to be much more complex. We used to have things called negotiated rulemakings, where we have ten operators vying for the same spectrum and you would fight it out and it, it was never very pretty and so the commission reformed the process with this first come first serve process which really has kept licensing on a much more administrative level which I think is better for the industry and better for the commission. Now is it that way in, in international companies as well or are there different rules or, or different processes when you apply internationally? Today there is no government that auctions satellite spectrum internationally so across the board we go through a very similar process. We may have some market access issues in some countries that still haven't fully opened their markets or, or you know, benefit their own domestic satellite systems versus international systems. But in all in all, the international process is generally based on a first come, first serve approach. So it's almost like a plan you would uh, make to venture capitalists, so to speak. Here's our plan, here's our viability, here's how we can sustain it. That's what you have to make your case to the FCC? They don't even have to look at the financial elements of it. I mean, because you have to meet these milestones, you can't enter for a contract and you, you have to demonstrate that you're actually building your system. So you can't meet those requirements unless you're actually spending money. So it's a little bit different than that. Uh, when it comes to the world of emergency response, what, where does satellite play in? Oh, we're critical to emergency response, and I think this is an area where satellites really excel. Um, and the, and the, it's being more and more recognized. The FCC, um, I know you spent a lot of time on the show talking about the 700 megahertz block mm -hmm. auction, and this particular band, the D block, mm -hmm. and the D block, just to remind mm -hmm. folks, is the block that they're looking to put a public-private public public partnership for public safety. And the FCC, as part of a D-block requirement um, before the last auction, required that satellite be a component of the public safety network, recognizing 
the importance of the ubiquity and the reliability of satellites. And if you think back to Katrina, um, when the communications terrestrial infrastructure was down, really the only communications out there was satellite, whether it was fixed satellite, um, you know, satellite service to Walmart, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Walmart was able to keep running during Katrina um, because it had a satellite-enabled communication system to do credit card transactions and others, or mobile satellite system where you actually had handsets out there in the field providing service. Um, the governor of Mississippi, for example, um, operated over our system during Katrina. So it's very, very important when the terrestrial infrastructure is down and is a redundant form of communications. So how many satellites are involved in this communications process? Uh, is it several? Is it uh, many or how many? Around the world? Uh -huh. Oh, hundreds. I mean, if, if you, you know, just, just to give you an idea um, of some of the players and maybe break it down, there's, there's essentially two types of primary satellite operators that provide emergency communications, fixed satellite operators and mobile satellite service operators. Um, mobile Satellite Ventures is a good example of a mobile satellite operator. We provide service to, to small terminals um, or handheld terminals, um, like Iridium is another good example in Marsat. Um, provide service um, to vehicles, to handheld devices on planes and on boats. Then you have the fixed satellite service industry. And those are folks like Intelsat um, or SES Americom. They provide um, services tend to be to cable head ends, for example. Um, all your, some things that you don't think about, all the gas car transactions. Those are done um, by satellite? Those are done by satellites. If you look behind your gas station, you'll probably see a small, a small satellite dish. Um, there's numerous transactions that are involved in daily life, um, and those are provided by what we call usually VSATs, very small antennas. Um, so those are the two primary, and they're both involved in emergency response communications for different purposes. Well, one of the issues that came up from the D block is trying to get a public-private partnership done. It didn't happen as far as the, the actual block being sold. You used to work at the FCC, from what I recall. Mm -hmm. Could you put that hat on as well as what you do currently and see what happened as far as the D block, as far as the satellite system is concerned, and why nobody bid it on it? And what could be changed maybe from your perspective and make it maybe more viable for companies like yours? Well, first off, no one has, um, no one objected to the satellite requirement. Um, just to be a little more specific, the satellite requirement was to enable one device to have a satellite capability, um, one public safety device. Mm -hmm. um, the commission is actually issuing an NPRM that's supposed to be adopted on Thursday of this week, so we'll know very soon what they're, a little bit more about what they're planning. And I think what you'll see is, um, and I should back up and say, I think the Commission really tried something very innovative with this public-private partnership, and, and I'm very hopeful that the next round everything will be successful. Um, in terms of satellite, I don't think the Commission went quite far enough. Um, one device is nice, but if you don't have that one device, you're out of trouble, you're in trouble. So I think from an emergency response perspective, um, with the new sorts of satellites that are being launched today, such as ours that are going to have very large antennas, mm -hmm. which means you don't need a large antenna to the phone. It'll look just like your cell phone, and I think you actually have um, one of our devices. Right. Um, so it would be something like a, a handheld unit, exactly. like, like this model here. And it will cost um, pretty much the same, very similar to the cost for a cell phone. So if every device, every public safety device was enabled with a satellite chipset, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, wherever you are, if you're in a rural location, if, um, if the terrestrial infrastructure goes down, public safety would have an automatic backup. So when you say one satellite or one device, does that mean that if I'm a locality and I wanted to invest in a system for emergency communications, I can only buy a handset from one person, and you're saying that this should be the option to buy from many people that could work on the same system? A little bit different. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to say is, um, so what the commission required was the public safety license, the D-Block licensee is going to have a, an array of, of devices available. It might have six handsets available and a couple of Wi-Fi de devices and maybe a couple of data devices. Um, but the commission's rules only require one of them to have satellite capability. Got it. Um, what, what my belief is, is that's a very good start, but I think it needs to be taken further to really make sure that public safety has the availability of satellite in, in devices when they need them, you really need to make sure you put it in all of them. 
because otherwise you'll have the one device, you'll be in a situation, a Katrina-like situation, and if you have the, you know, one of ten devices that doesn't have the, the satellite capability and the terrestrial network goes down, you'll be out of luck. Um, the cost to add this today with these next generation satellites is really nominal. Um, we put in a filing to the FCC estimating five to seven dollars more in terms of cost. So it's, it's fairly small. And so uh, once the FCC kind of de decides what they want to do with it, then you'll know satellite, you'll, I guess, a, a better sense of what satellite's role is going to be. That's correct. And, and that's actually, we're expecting that this will be an issue that's addressed in the NPRM that's being issued by the Commission. And both MSV and, and the Satellite Industry Association will likely file comments. Um, there's also other approaches that could be taken. The Commission could limit some of the rules and, and give licensees more flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, there were very stringent build-out requirements, so the Commission could give the licensee some flexibility on geographic build-out if, if they use a, a broader satellite requirement. So there's many ways that the FCC could work with this to ensure that satellite capability gets out to the emergency response. You had community. mentioned uh, one of the issues I guess you're involved in and something we talk about quite frequently on this show is the, the state of broadband in the United mm -hmm. States and many ventures on the ground trying to make that happen. What's satellite's role in that? It's actually an exciting role. Um, as you know, there's areas of, of the country that are in, in very rural areas where, where terrestrial infrastructure build out is much slower. And satellite plays a great role in terms of uh, far-reaching, being far-reaching, ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And so satellite has a very important role in providing broadband services to underserved areas. So give us some examples of, of people currently doing Is that part of what you're doing? We are going to do in our next generation. We'll be providing a mobile broadband service. Um, today there's two companies, three companies, that are actually up and providing broadband over satellite. There's Wild Blue that provides a direct-to-home broadband service. Um, Hughes, a division of Hughes, also provides broadband, and, and Marsat provides a, a mobile broadband service. So as far as someone who's in a rural area, is, the, is it co almost like getting a, a satellite dish for their television? They would install it and then they would have broadband. Exactly. Is it more reliable than an on-the-ground system? It's, I, I wouldn't say it's less reliable. Um, I think the, the, broader, the bigger issue is the speeds. Satellite has certain technical limitations that make very, very, very high speeds um, harder to reach because of capacity issues and how much you can launch, how much weight you can launch into space and, and all these rocket science issues, which I'm not a rocket scientist. Um, but, um, but it's a very good, reliable service um, with speeds, you know, in the 500K to 1 meg range if that helps. And do, do you find that a lot of people are investing in this uh, this kind of technology and is it I guess as far as a cost is concerned what is the the cost for consumer for having a satellite access to broadband? Um, I'm not an expert on the cost on this um, so I, I can't answer that question but in terms of people investing I think all the next generation satellite systems are moving to broadband capabilities so you'll see more and more of these systems being deployed in the next few years. Because companies like yours rely on rockets to get your ventures into space talk about I guess how you look at issues like NASA how, and how you look at issues like private companies who are, are doing uh, you know space payloads, uh, so to speak. I guess, how do you monitor that, and what do you see in the future as far as helping your business is concerned? It's a very interesting question, and a, a complex question. Today, there's just a handful of, of launch service providers. It is a, um, a risky business. Um, I'm sure you've read there's some, sometimes we have satellite, you know, launch failures, and, and we have a lot of good news stories, too. Mm -hmm. um, and we're actually very hopeful that the launch industry will progress and there'll be more competition. Right now there's just a handful of players and the, the operators would like to see more competition as we progress. So do you depend on NASA at all or is it just essentially do you depend on private uh, folks to, to bring your products into space? Private folks. How often are you launching? Um, on an well, for us, we have two launches, one scheduled for 2009, 2010, but you know, ver there's regular sat commercial satellite launches going up all the time. And so once your product gets into space, then what happens then as far as your monitoring is concerned? And how do you, I guess, as technology changes and demands on and use changes, and because of the nature of the business that's changing all the time, how, how, what's the lifespan of a satellite? Well, a lifespan of a satellite is about 15 years. 
And you ask a very good question because technology is starting to catch up with that and recognize that you can't have a static satellite system for 15 years into space. And so it's switched to something called ground-based beam forming. And essentially, Which sounds very technical. It does sound very technical. <laughs> um, but it, it's a simple concept. What happens is we've taken the smarts from the set that have normally been carried into space and put them on the ground. So essentially, the satellite is the equivalent of a bent, bent pipe in space, and the intelligence is on the ground. So you're able to upgrade to adapt to new technologies. So it's an exciting new thing. Um, uh, companies are starting to deploy this more and more, and I think almost every company with their new systems will be putting in ground-based beam forming. So in a practical sense, where does that mean as far as the consumer is concerned? What would it mean for them? It means that um, satellite operators are able to adapt to technologies rapidly, and so the consumers will be able to see the latest pro products on satellite systems. So what happens when a satellite, to, for lack of a better term, becomes defunct or it's not needed anymore? I mean, I suppose that's an issue too because I guess there are those, especially those in the environmental front, would be concerned about what's happening in space as far as what's space junk as it's called. Right, and we have requirements. There's actually an FCC order on orbital debris and actually requires us to deorbit our satellites, which means move it out of the orbit where the other communication satellites are to a location that's safe. How's that done? That, that's a little <laughs> bit of magic. Um. Um, so as far as, the, and, and you mentioned a good point. When you go to the FCC with these issues and you make these presentations, and I know that you don't apply for auction, so to speak, do you not only have to tell them, uh, do they assign you not only the actual amount of spectrum that you use, but do they also assign you your place in space as well? Yes, that's correct. Um, there's two different types of satellite systems, um, primarily. Um, there's geostationary orbit satellite systems and non-geostationary orbit satellite systems. Our satellite system is a geostationary orbit satellite uh, system, which Does means... Does that mean it stays the same? That's right. It means that at about 22,300 miles above the Earth, above the equator, there's a location where you can launch a satellite and it will essentially stay stationary above that point. Mm -hmm. um, and when I apply for a license, for example, I'll say I want to be at 63.5 degrees west longitude, and that gives me a certain maneuvering room, but that's essentially my location to operate, and I'll also say I want to operate in a certain frequency range. Um, Non-geostationary orbit satellites operate um, substantially lower, some in approximately, let's say, 500 mile range above the Earth, and they often operate in planes uh, on the commercial um, telecommunication side. So for instance, the Iridium system has 66 satellites that operate in a non-geostationary orbit. They're not assigned a specific orbital location because their satellites are constantly moving into different directions. A couple more uh, questions. Uh, as I was reading the material, I came across a term that I that you may have explained already, but maybe not, an ancillary terrestrial component. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's a good question. Um, that was part of the FCC's um, approach to enabling new technologies for satellite systems. And what the commission did in 2003 was created a new regulatory regime where they said, you know, you can reuse the, uh, the spectrum you use in space for your satellite on the ground and offer the integrated satellite terrestrial service, the handset that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, um, using the same spectrum. So we have a right, Mobile Satellite Ventures, um, and there's one other U.S. licensee and a couple of applications from other companies to reuse our satellite spectrum to offer terrestrial service on the ground. And the Commission's rules require that it be offered as an integrated service um, and that it cover the country, and there's a few other requirements. But it's a very exciting service because it really transforms um, satellite communications. As you may know, handsets for satellite have traditionally been fairly expensive in the hundreds of dollars to $3,000 range for a mobile terminal. What this does, it allows um, mobile satellite operators to capture the economies of scale that you see in terrestrial uh, wireless services. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you're not just serving several hundred thousand customers, you're serving millions of customers and your cost of your handsets come down and your units start to look more attractive, especially with the big antennas that are going up into space. And so that allows you to be competitive with those who are on the ground. That's correct. So when you, as far as competition is concerned, when your company takes a look at say Last week there was an uh, announcement by Sprint Nextel mm -hmm. to offer a WiMAX system and, and you know offer you know service over long range. 
how do you look at what's happening on the ground as far as um, you know those companies and others and say how do we stay competitive uh, what go what thought process goes into that um, well I think that all these types of systems are our competitors um, for the next generation what we call MSS ATC it means a combined satellite mobile satellite and ancillary terrestrial component system okay. but I think because we have the satellite component we're a, we're a little bit better I think over time what you're gonna see is that the terrestrial systems are also going to start to recognize the value of having the redundancy of a satellite and ubiquity of a satellite service and over time I think everyone's going to want to have the satellite component I know my mother would like to have it in her cell phone essentially does that mean if I'm talking to some way halfway across the world it'd be as clear as how I'm talking to you which some which some uh, phone services offer now but is it a sense of clarity is it a, or is it a sense of being able to connect anywhere in the world with a satellite-based phone and things like that? Well, it's no different. It'll be no different. It hooks into the public switch telephone network just like a, a cellular phone does. Um, in terms of service quality, it should be comparable. Um, but what it does is, um, let me give you an example. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with satellite radio, XM or Sirius. Sure. Um, when most people think of satellite radio, they assume that they're on the satellite the entire time for communications. Satellite radio works very similar to the way MSS ETC will, in that while you're in the urban locations where it makes more sense from a spectrum efficiency um, basis, you switch to a terrestrial network. And then when you go out into more rural areas, let's say you're driving down in Washington, down 66 towards Leesburg, you switch over to the satellite. And it's seamless to the user. That's the same thing that's going to happen with an MSS ATC phone, except it's two-way voice or two-way data. So all of a sudden, you, you'll be able to switch over without dropping a call. If there's the terrestrial infrastructure is unavailable because of an emergency, you'll, you'll switch over to the satellite. So it has a lot of benefits in that regard. Just about finished, but how did you get into the satellite field? Oh, I love satellites. Um, I took a space law class in, at Georgetown and really fell in love with space. And then um, I've had the opportunity to work with um, on satellite issues both at the FCC and in private practice and continuing now. Aside from what you do for your business, what's the future of satellites five, ten years down the road? What kind of things are, are you watching out for as far as either technology or how satellites are used? I think you're going to see more and more recognition of the importance of satellite. As I said, I think over time you're going to see pretty much every communications device enabled with satellite technology. I also think that spectrum is going to continue to be used more efficiently and you'll see more satellite terrestrial applications across the board reusing the same spectrum. You'll see smaller, more cost-effective devices that are more available to consumers. So you'll be able to walk into Best Buy and see a lot more satellite-enabled devices. So I think it's a very exciting time for us. Jennifer Manor is the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Mobile Satellite Ventures. Thanks for being on The Communicators. Thank you.